way. Please help me watch this uh, counter. I don't want to go over. If it gets to 13, I don't seem to be knowing that it's at 13. Let me know. Um, okay, so this idea called a limit. Let's go through this mathematical definition first, and then, um, and then we'll talk about what it means to us in everyday life. It says, um, if f of x, and before, just stopping right there, f of x, we know that as a function. What we need to think of it, though, is more than just a function called f with something parentheses x. There are two parts to every function. Have I mentioned that to you? Yeah. Okay, I got one yes. I hope the yes is back there. Okay. Um, input and output. Okay, input and output. That's why we, I spent time with section 1.4 and actually wanted to lecture it with you instead of just having you do it on your own because it's so important that we think about uh, exactly what this is we're talking about. This is, no, this is notation, but it represents an output. So if I read this as if the output values or the output value, yeah, value of the function becomes arbitrarily close to a single number. So now let's look at this. From what we've read so far, would you say that L represents an input value or an output value? If f of x, if the outputs become arbitrarily close to a single number, that has to be also an output. Okay. Output. As x, well, we kind of, I'll put this in green here for us. As x, we kind of know that to be an input, right? Usually is in our work. Approaches c. So what does c, an input value or an output value? So I'll put this in green here. So as x, x is in the, as the input, if the input variable's value is approaching something called a you know, c here, then that must also be input. So we've got now that our inputs are approaching some predetermined destination. And as I take the input closer and closer and closer to this predetermined point on the horizontal axis, my question, and there's, there's a question that it always comes up, and that is, I wonder what's happening to the outputs. That's really what we're doing here. We are letting the inputs, we are determining, we're in control of the inputs. And we are making those inputs get really, really, really close to some predetermined value on that horizontal axis. And we're asking ourselves as we bring that input closer and closer, I wonder what's happening with those output values. Okay? <coughs> now that's about as, as simple and maybe some people say as non-mathematical as you can make it, but to me it's the most mathematical because we can visualize that, right? We're moving those input values closer and closer and closer to some predetermined value, and we're asking us out ourselves what's happening to the outputs. Okay, so from either side. Now, this is important. So if I want to bring, if this is my input axis here, and I have some marker right here, and I bring my input value closer and closer. This is coming up from the less than. Yeah, this is 2. I'm coming up from on values less than 2 if I do this. And on this side, I'm coming up on values greater than 2. So we have to think of this as coming from either side. Okay, so as I do this from either side, so if this is my value C, I'm coming up from greater than and coming up from less than. The limit of the, don't read that as f of x, you're going to read that as what? Outputs. The limit of the output values as the input values approach C, the limit is that single number L. And this is the notation that we write. Again, you know all the mathematics you need to for this course. I'm not going to really teach you too much new stuff. Because everything we're going to talk about is based in really what you learned back in Algebra 1, Algebra 2. So you know everything. We just have to understand what the notation is saying. So when we look at this, this piece down here is that input. The limit as the input values approach that predetermined location. 
what are the output values doing? And the answer to that is going to be a single value, a single number. Okay. Now, this is the basis for everything else we talk about, this whole concept of a limit. And again, we deal with limits out in the world outside the math classroom. Uh, we don't write them in this notation, but the concept is there. So keep thinking of that concept. Now, we're going to use multiple approaches to determine these limits. We're going to look at a uh, numerical approach, which means we're going to do a table. I'm going to show you how to do a table and to do list and spreadsheet. We're going to take a look at a graphical approach, which means we're going to draw a graph. We're going to place a point on it. And we're going to take that point and move it closer to where we want it to be. And we're going to keep our eye on what's happening to the output values so we can do a graphical. And last but not least is the good old move the numbers around to get an answer, the analytical way. Now, I say it in that sense because this is the only way I knew how to do it was analytical. I had really very little understanding of any of this mathematics when I was studying it back in college in my undergrad years because it was all done symbolically. Now we can show it and, and, and appreciate it and understand it these ways. So we're going to work with all three of those processes. When it comes time for the quiz for this section, I'm going to ask you to do a limit, to uh, determine a limit, and you're going to determine it analytically. You're going to show me all your analytical work, and then I always tag on, usually I tag on at least, another piece, part B. Show me your, your understanding of this by giving me a graphical representation or a numerical. And so we want to, I want to make sure you understand these as we go through it. So let's begin. Can't see the time there, can we? Let's move that out. Um, we're going to use all three approaches to determine the limit of this. Now let's break it apart. You know, if you read things with L-I-M, X, arrow, it, it, you, lose, you lose the understanding of it. We have to read them as if we're reading a, a, a novel to someone. So we've got, um, we're looking at, uh, as X approaches, as the inputs get closer and closer to negative 3, what is the limit of our output values? In other words, what are the output values doing? So I'm going to... I'm going to kind of help us out here a little bit. I'm going to put this in brackets. And I'm going to remind myself that this is the, this is how I'm going to get the output values. I'm going to take the inputs and subtract 1 and take the square root of that and subtract 2 and then divide all of that by x plus 3. So I want to know what are my, what are my outputs doing as x gets closer and closer to negative 3. Okay, let's open up our uh, inspires. And I don't like it that I lose that. It's only in this class that I lose that. I don't know why. So we'll keep put that over here for now. Okay. So in the inspires, uh, we're going to, uh, let's go home and open up a new document. Let's always do that. And if you've been working on it, you probably have to just say no. You don't want to save unless you truly want to save it. Then go ahead and do that. Uh, let's... Uh, Add a calculator page, and um, yeah, we'll define the function first. So go to menu, go to actions, go to define, and we're, we'll define this as f1 of x. And f1 of x equals, now we need a fraction, remember how we get a fraction on this? Um, just a little reminder, control on the um, division gives us a fraction template. Um, we need, you need a square root, so find the square root on top of the x squared key. And uh, 1 minus x. Be sure you move outside of the square root sign. If you don't move outside the square root sign, you're going to have a radicand that says 1 minus x minus 2. And we want to take the square root and then subtract 2. So be sure that you have that. Yeah? How do we uh, put the equal sign in there again? Uh, the equal sign um, is on the left-hand side. So go outside. Yeah, get outside of the parentheses. And then... Okay. Um, or did you move outside of the parentheses? 
I'm going to take another step to the right, just to be sure. Okay, got it. Okay, and then the denominator is x plus 3. And when you have all that typed in there, you always press enter, and we're done. We're just defining this so now we can use it and we can work on it. What we want to do is to um, look at some values to put in here. We want x to approach 3. So one of the ways that we could show that would be to, um, you know, do a table of values. You know, x and if you want to, you can say y or f of x. And if I want to get closer and closer to negative 3, um, I could, um, well, I could put in, let's say, um, negative 4. That's pretty close to negative 3, but how much closer can I get? Good. Negative 3.5, I could do that. How much closer can I get? 3.9, negative 3.9, good. Can't get any closer? <laughs> as close as your mind can imagine. Okay, we're going to get really, really close on that. So, how can we use the Inspire? Well, right now, I honestly don't want to try to, um, to do this in my head, so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to have to have some help with this, so if I come over here, uh, what I can do is say F1 of, uh, whoops, let me make sure I put a 1 in there, F1 of, um, what do we, let's start with the uh, point, or excuse me, got to start with negative, negative 3, well, let's try that again, negative 3.9, we'll just jump at that one. And we have a value, but I know I can get closer yet. And so I'm using the notation that I've set up for this in a, uh, the way I would do it on paper and pencil. Um, and I would put in now negative 3 point, and we'll, we'll put in that 9999, as close as I can think. And the question is, can you see what, where the output values may be going on this? Well, let's try another one. We, we do this until we're, we're confident that we've got, um, oh, stop me when I make a mistake like this. What's wrong? I see my error. Do you? What do I want to approach? So why do I have a um, 9 here? Who told me to put 9 there? I don't know. <laughs> Someone over here spoke up, so, okay. So we, we better do this right now. So this shouldn't be 3.9, it should be what? 3.1, yeah, and then it, should, it could be what? 3.01, good, now we're working. See, you can't just let me have my way up here because I'm going to lead you guys astray sometimes. I don't mean to, but, you know, it happens. But give me one more. Negative 3. what? And then a one? Yeah, anything as close as you can get to that. Okay, let's go back here because that truly was not what we wanted to be. And I knew we were on the wrong path because I couldn't see the answers converging to a value. Now I'm going to stop this uh, timer. Here. I'm going to stop the recording. I want you to go ahead and correct the work that we have here. And then I'll come back and catch up with you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, on a window, we might want to uh, look at uh, negative 4 and then tab. And we don't need a whole lot of positives, so we'll just do um, 1 on that. And we'll tab. And probably scale by 1, so we can just type a 1 in there. And the output, um, I think I'll go, because what I saw before, a negative 1 to 1, scale 1. Okay, when you're ready, we can tab down to OK. And that looks just a little bit better. 
than what we had. Now remember, we're looking at bringing the input values really, really close to this 3 right here at this point. Yes? How did you get to that last window to put all this up here? Go to Menu, go to Window, okay. and you have Window Settings. Okay, you can, you know, you can count by whatever you wish, but I'll just count by ones here. Okay, everyone have that window? Okay, so now I'm going to go to Menu, go to Points and Lines, and make sure that I have Point On. I don't want to point just anywhere in space, or in the plane rather, I just want to point on. And I want to point on the graph, so I'm just going to go and go to the graph and hit enter a couple of times to make sure that those coordinates stay. I think I'll put another point up here on the axis right about where it's 3, so I can kind of keep my eye on that. Okay, remember, keep your eye on that upper left-hand corner. It still says I'm ready to put a point, and when I'm done, I need to escape from that. So when you're finished putting the point in, you can hit Escape. Now all we have to do is, I'm just going to move this point as close to negative 3 as I can. Now, I wasn't really thinking about this problem, I don't think, because now I'm thinking, my goodness, why? of course that's why we got the answers that we were getting. Let's go back. You know, the thing that, and it happens to me, so I know it happens to you too. We can get so involved pushing buttons, the brain turns off. Do you realize that? Have you recognized that in yourself? We push the buttons, and you're following very well, and if I were to go to my, um, you know, screen capture and watch, I can see you guys are doing excellent. But I'm as guilty as you sometimes. My brain just turned off. So let's, put a, let's turn the brain back on here. Think about this. We're approaching what value? Negative 3. Look at this function. What's going to happen if I put negative 3 into that? Now, Curtis. You told me, you came up and said, why does mine say that it's undefined, right? We found a mistake anyway, we needed to correct. But it might not have been because of that at all. And I should have stopped and thought right then, why does it say undefined? Look at that. If I put negative 3 in here, that makes a zero denominator. That, of course, makes the fraction undefined. Okay. So if I bring this, if I try to bring this point really, really, really close to negative 3, do you think I can put it right at negative 3? Now, I think I taught you how to change the value of a point to make it go right to where you want. No? I'm going to show you now. Okay. Take your cursor, move it so that you're hovering over the input value. Just hover. If you hover over the input value, it, it should go into a shadow. It's not going to be crisp and clear, but it's going to shadow it out or, you know, kind of, you know you're, you know you're over at that. Okay? When you're there, I want you to hit enter twice. When you hit enter twice, you've opened up a text box. Now we're going to backspace delete. And guess what value we're going to put in there? Negative 3. Yeah. When you have that done, you're going to press Enter. What does it say? Mine says it can't do it. Ah. I'd have to go back and see what you typed in because it should say invalid input. Okay, now, because we have some discrepancies on this, I'm going to go back right now and look at everyone. So don't move your, don't move what you've got on the screen, on your screen. Let me just take a look, see if I can help us out any at all. We're doing on time. Five minutes? Okay. 
So let's see here. Who says that it says negative 2.5? Let's see if we can see. If you see it and I don't, call it out. There's one up on the top corner, negative 3, negative 2.5. Negative 3, negative 2.5. Sure enough. Okay, hang on. Whoever that is, hang on to that. Don't, don't move yours. Here's another one that says negative 3.25. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take this person. Okay, um, what I want you to, this person to do, um, I want you to hover over this quantity. Just hover over there. Don't do anything else. Very good. Okay. Now, I want you on the side over here where it says uh, pluses and minus, I want you to, to hit the plus sign. Okay. Now, I want you to do something else. I want you to move the cursor to the negative 3 and do the exact same thing. Ah! That person didn't do what I told them to do the first place, did they? I'm guessing. I can't say for sure, but I'm guessing. I'm guessing that this person picked that point up and moved it to where it said negative 3. They didn't change the coordinate to be negative 3. It rounded to the closest it could be, okay? but it isn't really, really there because it can't. It can't be there. It's not possible to be there. Okay. So that's how we can find out if, if it truly is. Okay, this person, would you please hover over this input value and type in negative 3. There we go. Okay? So it is possible to have it come close to that and look as if it's really there, but it really truly isn't. Okay? Uh, anyone else have a question? Okay, let's go back then and look. Let me make sure of the time here. Okay, so we, we cannot move it there. Now, I'm, I'm doing this to say that we, I want you to be able to show me graphically that you understand that that point cannot exist, but if it could, it would be very close to negative 2.5. So let's do this. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fool the inspire to think we're there when we really aren't. So hover over that input value. Press enter twice, open up a text box, and now I want you to put in negative 2.99999. One of those that comes really, really close. And it will round it. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna keep it there. Because what I'm working toward is, I want you to be able to I want you to be able to do this work on the quiz next Thursday. I believe yours is on Thursday. Now, you won't have the section on that, but if I ask you to do graphical work, I want you to know how to do it. Okay, so now we know that if we could get as close as we can think to it, it's going to, output values are going to go almost negative 2.5. Now, if you show me this graph, though, I'm going to say, no. That's not true. Because this point does not really exist on this graph, does it? In, on paper and pencil, how do you express graphically that a point does not exist? Graphically, what do you do? Open circle. Okay. So if we could put an open circle at negative 3, what we see there, then we would be able to express the same thing that you can do on paper and pencil. By the way, do you have to do this on an Inspire? No, you don't. Okay? You don't. Some of you are going to be stressed out enough during the test, the quiz, you're not going to want to have to think about how to use the Inspire, and that's perfectly okay. Others of you are going to be doing just fine, and you, you're going to want to know this. So listen up if you're one of those people. Go to Menu. Go to Actions. Go down to what's called attributes. I'll do that again. Menu, action, attributes. Okay? When you press attributes and you move towards something that can be changed, in this case that point, 
Now this says point on, be sure it says point on. I can make it say graph. I don't want to change the way the graph looks. I want to change the way the point looks. Press enter and you have the opportunity to change the way that point looks by pressing the right arrow key and we have we have op empty circles, we have squares, we have empty squares, we have a cross, we have a plus, we have a thin point, we have a large point, we have an empty large and that's what I'm going to choose. Now I have a point on that graph just like I was drawing it expressing the fact that that point's really not on there. Now this work coupled with your analytical work hopefully brings you closer to understanding what we're doing with a problem that looks like that. Okay, this is the problem we're working on. Again, we're talking about we're moving those input values very, very close to negative three. And we want to know what's happening to the outputs. We can do it numerically. We can do it with our inspires just you know putting a value in that f1 of x we can do it with the spreadsheet we can also then show our understanding with with this now this point up here uh, it's not something that I would even really probably uh, want to have I don't really want you to have that so I'm going to go through where it says thin there we go and I'm just going to put a very thin point there and, and forget that it's even there okay any questions about this so far? Well, I check our time. Okay. If I ask you to do this, and I again, most of this has been recorded. Just a few minutes, been, excuse me, minutes of the first part did not get on there. Okay. Let's go on then to our next problem here. Um, there is another, there's a symbolic way that we can show this happening. And uh, let me just stop this right now. And um, um, we can do some more symbolic work with this, uh, with our Inspire. So let's go back and look at this one more time. Uh, I'm going to go back to my analytical page. And if we all define this function correctly, we have this someplace in our, in our work. f1 of x equals the square root of 1 minus x. Move outside of the square root before you type the negative 2 and then plus 3. If that is the case, there is another way that you can look at the limit. I'm going to show this to you as a way for you to check your work. Um, if you do control Excuse me, I'm working on two uh, inspires at the same time. On this inspire, if you use the button right beside the 9 key, we pull up the symbols palette. On the gray copy, you have to do control multiplication. Control multiplication brings up the symbols palette. And right down here is the thing called the, the, palette, or the, excuse me, the template for limit. So we're going to uh, press limit on that. I'm going to um, make sure that I am on that proper page here. And press enter, and we have this symbols palette, or this uh, template. Now, this is the same thing as what we have over here in our, in our writing. We have the limit, so we have the limit. We're going to type x, tab, we're going to be approaching negative 3. So we're going to type in negative 3, tab. Now let me explain what this, this little other space place is up here. This is for if I'm going to come up to negative 3 from the less than negative 3 side, I put a little minus up there, which would indicate I'm only, go, only, excuse me, I'm only going to come to negative 3 from one direction, from values less than negative 3. If I'm going to come from the other direction, what would I put in that little space? A little plus, yeah. And that means I'm going to come up on negative 3 from the greater than negative 3 side. So that little area there is if you do what we call a one-sided limit. 
I'm not going to come up from both because I have to come up from both to do an actual limit, but I may choose to come up only on one side. So just tab to get past that because we're not going to do a one-sided. And here is where I can go through and type once again the fraction, the square root, and all of that. Have I told you I'm a lazy mathematician? I don't want to, have to type any more than I want than necessary. So what could I type in here instead of this, the fraction and the square root and all that? F1 of x, absolutely. Have I told you that when you see this bold F1 like this, it means you've already reserved the name in this document? And so we, uh, we know that it's up there. So press Enter. And what do we get as an answer? Are we surprised? No. No, we're not surprised at all. Because we know that that's exactly the value that we would expect to see on here from what we did numerically and graphically. Now, this is not an analytical approach. This is just a symbolic approach. This is just using the internal workings of the Inspire to kind of give us an answer. It's up to us to show what we understand about that problem and answer. Yeah? Um, um, I would have to go back and look to see what you have on... Um, Maybe you didn't type in F1 of X correctly. That's, that would be my first guess on that. <coughs> yes? So if we were to use that method on a test like that, what word could we show? Okay, I haven't shown you that yet. Okay. Um, actually, this one is not an impossible one, and, and chances are I'd have to go back in my notes again. We'll probably revisit it again to see. But um, it's, not, it's what we would call, in fact, as I recall, <laughs> the lecture you come up to on Thursday, tells you how to go about doing that. It's called rationalizing the numerator. So if you know how to rationalize the denominator, you just do it in the numerator instead, and we work on it. Okay. Uh, okay, so back to this information here. Um, it says uh, we can, you know, it, it's maybe kind of hard to see, but there's a little negative sign here. Can you see it from the back of the room? you got good eyes if you can. You can see the plus on this one, though, probably. Okay, so let's go back here, and let's, let's actually put in those symbols and see what happens. Again, you can retype that if you wish. I much prefer to use my energy a little differently, so I'm just going to go up, copy it, and bring it down. And all I have to do is to move the cursor back to that empty spot, that spot we skipped before. If I want to come up on uh, negative 3 from values less than negative 3, what symbol do I put there? Negative. Let's do it. Uh, try, put a negative. Don't put a subtraction. I, you, we'll try this and see. I think the negative, it could be the subtraction. You know, those are not exactly interchangeable. So let's try it. Yeah, it worked. Did anyone try the subtraction key? I want to try that and see. Still works. Still works? Okay, good. Go up and capture that again. Now we, we want to um, come up on negative 3 from the greater than negative 3 side, so put a plus in there. Use your up arrow key. Select it because it's all bold. Press Enter. Okay. So what we have here, we're going to find this out as we get into this section more, that the limit as we approach negative 3 exists because as I come up from the less than negative 3 side, and I come up from the greater than negative 3 side, those two one-sided limits are the same. And since they're the same, we know that the limit exists. Okay, um, we've got just a few more minutes here, and I really don't want to uh, jump too much into what I gave you on the video. don't want to ruin your excitement about seeing those videos. Uh, so I'm, I, what I want to do now is to pause a little bit and what I did in the other two classes, we had the same amount of time, was we actually went back and looked at some things on the Inspire that they'd had questions about, the students in the other classes, but we never had a chance to talk about them in class. And one of them was doing a regression equation. 
And I can't remember, did you have any of those questions in your algebra review? Regression equations. You know what I'm talking about? How about when you put things in a, uh, a table and you have to draw a graph and a scatter plot, and then you have to come up with the equation that would, you didn't have any of those? Okay, so we can look at that because that will be uh, coming up. Um, the other thing, let me check my time here. Okay, the other thing that I want to do is to help you to know where to go to find some answers when, you know, you're going to email me and I can't get back to you or um, something happens and, um, you know, I give you information and it's not really what you were looking for. So if you would please uh, go to um, education.ti.com. So this is the, if you have, um, have you seen this? I have this as a link on, um, on the website. This is the, the home location for uh, Texas Instrument Graphing Calculators. And um, if you go in the middle of this, you have this thing called product support. And down under product support is a little tab that says tutorials. Now I think someone, someone and forgive me for forgetting, but someone in here has already gone to tutorials and the, the, uh, the watch the video in the homework for WebAssign and found that those are really helpful. So, you know, don't overlook the, hint, the hints and the help that we can give you. If you're in that, you went to tutorials, you go down to this thing called Atomic Learning. So if you can just remember education.ti.com and then um, go into uh, that product support. Find you, you guys are good at finding your way across a um, website, but uh, there we go. This is the atomic learning. Now, I don't know, someone in here might have asked me for this already, but I know at least two people and someone of my, somewhere in my classes uh, have asked. You can, uh, you can go to where it's working with a touchpad. Who has touchpads? Yeah, those that have the black ones. And the click pads are the gray ones. Okay, so you can look exactly uh, for the handheld that you have. So I'll go to touchpad. And you've got now basics. You've got using the keypad, um, assessing and using the catalog, anything you want on that. You've got, uh, here's this list in spreadsheets, manually entering the list of data. So if you go there, the, the person will just actually take almost four minutes to go down and talk about how to enter data into the list and spreadsheets. We'll go into how to do a scatter plot and a regression, but I will tell you there's a better way. And that better way is down here in data and statistics. So I, that's the part I'd like to show, to show you so that when we get to it, you have a little bit of an understanding of what's happening here. Okay. But anyway, I want you to know that there, is this, uh, there are these tutorials available to you. And anything you want to learn about the uh, Inspire, just go to one of these tutorials. Okay, so let's go into uh, how to do a uh, regression. Now, you've done those in high school, right? In other math classes? Everyone, everyone does these in algebra. So I don't think we're doing anything unusual here. Um, Let's see, where's my inspire? There we go. Um, what we're going to do, and I, I definitely want to save this and give it to you on the, um, in the video in case some of you want to see exactly what we did here in class. Uh, what I want you to do is um, I want you to open up a new problem, a new problem. Now, if you go to uh, control, menu, uh, control home, on this, good luck on that. Okay. Uh, control home, you have insert. On the uh, black models there, if you do um, document, just press document. Don't do control document, just do document. And we can go into insert and we can insert a whole new problem. And we're going to insert a list and spreadsheet. Now, the difference between uh, what we did before and what we're doing now is. This is um, starting over the count. So we can go back and do F1 of X. We don't have to jump to a new count. And I suggest you do a new problem when you start a new problem and then uh, in your homework also. Okay, we're going to go in here. And again, we did this before. We're going to write uh, input and output, just anything at all. We're going, I'm going to put in just a few items here 
in the input, and I'm going to stop this timer, uh, this recording, and then start it again. So I'm going to put in, uh, before I do that, one, two, three, four, five. I'm just going to put a really simple little five numbers there. And I'm going to put other numbers, so I'm making sure that I'm not linear or anything that I can tell. So I'm going to put a 2 and a 5 and a 9 and a 11 and a 16 in there. So it shouldn't be linear. I don't know what I put in there, but it shouldn't be linear. Okay. Again, the uh, Atomic Learning List and Spreadsheet will tell you how to do it the other way. I'm going to show you what I think is probably an easier way to do it. So if you, while you do that, I'm going to... What I just said was that uh, we, we do the spreadsheet, then we go to uh, home and pick up a data and, or data and statistics. Okay, so we get this, um, this thing here. Now you see down at the bottom it says click to add variable. In the uh, gray model, move your cursor down, and then the black one also, move your cursor down to where you are at the very bottom and it says click or enter so do that click or enter and you get now a choice it's either input or output what do you put along the horizontal input data or output data input so we do input press enter and everything moves it's, it's what you really have created right now is a frequency chart Every one of those only was only recorded once. Move your cursor to the other axis. We're just looking at the first quadrant that we're doing here. First quadrant, and press enter, and you've got now an output. Okay, so you just have to move your cursor to the edge of that. Now, if you had data that went into the other quadrants, it would show the other quadrants. Okay, but we don't, so it just shows the first quadrant. Okay, now looking at that scatter plot, we can, you know, we could assume it to be linear. So go to menu, go down to analyze, and you see this thing called regression. Let me do that again. You go menu, analyze, and regression. And you choose the one that you think will best fit. So I'm going to choose linear for this one. And when I choose linear, it's there. Okay? That's all it took. Now, it has it as y equals. It doesn't say f1 of x. It says y equals. you got to keep that in mind. The other thing is, if I take and pick up one of these points, notice that I can move. And when I move the point, of course, the line's moving too because the line's approximating where that is. And because I moved that point, if I go back to the spreadsheet, notice that point's coordinates have changed. So that's something to keep in mind. You can alter that data if you want. Now, we've got this linear equation, but let's say that what we really need to do now is to use that to compute other values from it, like F1 of 4 or F1 of 8. We can't do that from what, what we see here, so we're going to, we're going to make it so we can. Um, we're going to insert a... Um, we're going to insert a calculator page. Remember how we define? We go to actions. Now instead of we've, uh, defining, we're going to recall. We're going to recall. And we're going to recall, now we're going to recall the stat regression equation. Because that's what was computed when we had to do the regression. So we're going to do stat regression equation. And this is giving us a whole lot more digits than we saw on the, on the graph page. Okay. Again, if, if you feel this is overload, that's, you know, don't worry about it. You can go back and look at this. I will get this posted hopefully before I leave today. Now, I'm going to press enter. There it is, just like I would expect. But I would really like to change this not to say stat regression equation, but to change it to say F1, so I can now use it like I would normally. So I'm going to go up. I'm just going to copy it like I've been copying everything else. Press Enter. And I'm going to move the cursor all the way over. 
And when I get over here to the you know, this end of this, I'm going to start deleting. Oops, deleting, there we go. And I'm going to type in F1. And that's all I have to do in order to get that to be in the format that I want. Okay? Now, there's like quite a few steps in there. The first part of it's pretty easy. Okay? All you have to do is put the data there and then go get that scatter plot and do regression and you've got it. If you want to use that, you've got to do a few more steps. Um, this work is in that atomic learning, but it's not laid out maybe quite as because I want to get a regression equation in F1 of X. It just may take you so far and stop. So we've got it here. Okay, we've got five more minutes. Um, trying to think what else it was that we might need to tell you about before. Well, I'll tell you what. This is truly going to be the second time today I have a very rare occurrence. Enjoy. Five extra minutes after class, okay? If you have a question, hang around and we'll, uh, we'll answer it. Probably